Uh, good morning, everyone. And for those of you joining us online, uh, good evening uh, to those of you in the Asia Pacific. Good afternoon to those of you in Europe. Welcome to Coexistence 2.0, US-China Relations in a Changing World. I'm Mark Wu, Faculty Director for the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies here at Harvard University. And it's my pleasure to welcome all of you here today. We gather at a time when relations between the United States of America and the People's Republic of China are fraught. So much so that when our leaders smile when they shake hands, as they did in Bali this week, it's considered headline worthy. <laughs> the United States and the People's Republic of China each face challenges at home, politically, economically, socially. Yet, despite these challenges, each is confident confident that its political governance system is superior, confident that time and history is on its side, confident that its society is best equipped to harness the innovations and emergent technologies ahead to forge the societies in the futures of the 21st century. In different domains, as we will discuss today, one seeks to preserve the status quo, while the other seeks to change it. Yes, it's no exaggeration to say that the planet's two leading nations are locked in a strategic rivalry. Yet even amid this rivalry, there is a need for cooperation. Cooperation because we live on the same planet that is warming at alarming rates. Cooperation because we live in a world where viruses know no nationality nor boundaries. Cooperation because we face common threats from terrorists and anarchists determined to upend our societies. And cooperation because the future of humanity depends on it. So even as this rivalry comes into clear focus, we must find ways to coexist. And that brings us to the theme of this conference. Because in the end, despite our differences, despite our confidences, the vast majority of citizens of these two countries seek the same thing. Material security, physical security, opportunity, and a better future for our children. So in this time of competition, dialogue is more important than ever. That is why we are so encouraged to see so many of you here today with us, both at Harvard and online, from the US, from China, and from elsewhere. Because together, we must ponder the question of how we should shape the terms of our future coexistence between these two countries for the sake of our planet. I hope today's panel provokes even more dialogue with each other, and more importantly, that they forge new interpersonal connections amongst all of you gathered here today in Cambridge, as we find ways to manage what certainly will be some difficult times and choppy waters ahead in US-China relations. Before I proceed, please also allow me to acknowledge and thank our co-sponsor, the Harvard Kennedy School's Rajwali Foundation Institute for Asia, based at the Ash Center for Democratic Governance and Innovation. And also allow me to extend a word of special thanks to Orville Schell, Mary Kay Magistad, and the team at the Asia Society Center on US-China relations, and to Susan Shark and Lei Guang and the team at the US at the UC San Diego's 21st Century China Center. Without their support, this would not be possible because little more than two months ago, they were the ones who alerted us to the fact that so many of the country's leading thinkers on US-China relations would be gathered here in Boston this week. And they suggested to us that we take advantage of this opportunity to spark a dialogue. So I certainly hope we will kindle that fire today. And with that, let me turn it over to my partner in crime, my co-organizer, my colleague and friend, Tony Sage. Thanks very much, Mark. First of all, let me uh, second Mark's uh, words of thanks. I also want to thank uh, Mark for giving me an honorary appointment at the Harvard Law School, uh, which uh, I find extremely impressive as I've never ever studied law, which is useful in the context of China, I guess. Um, as Mark just said, we really are at a key moment in terms of the thinking about the relationship between Washington and Beijing, and both of them have really outlined very recently agendas uh, which really run uh, into conflict one with the other. Of course, uh, in Beijing, we've had the somewhat schizophrenic 20th Party Congress, 
in which Xi Jinping clearly outlined a model as an alternative to the West, politically, economically, as well as globally, focusing on the role of the party, industrial policy, Chinese style modernization, and clearly the idea of an international order, which is decentered from US dominance. And by contrast, really October, I think, was a crucial month of decision uh, for Washington. And there, of course, we had two uh, key documents which came out in the month of October. First of all was the banning of the export uh, to China of chips, semiconductors. And if that really goes through, that will have a huge impact on the capability of the Chinese economy to develop. And it's really just one in a very strong set of levers that the US could employ uh, to undermine development of the Chinese economy. And then of course, as we all know, there was a national security strategy, which clearly sees Russia more as a short-term problem, but China as the key long-term challenge. I think one of the questions that is my mind is really what is Washington's end game with this and with these actions? Is it just to affect change in certain practices of China, particularly focusing on those where uh, there's the sense it doesn't comply with uh, WTO uh, agreements, other agreements that it has signed on to? Or is it really to actually hamper entirely China's economic development and prevent it from in any way being a challenge to US hegemony? But as Mark just said, there is the need, despite those tensions uh, for collaboration, if we want to produce good global public goods. Without US-China participation in a number of key areas, it's very difficult to achieve uh, those uh, objectives. Um, and there, I tend to divide that into three different categories. First of all, what I see as global commons. And the global commons, obviously, one of the key examples is climate change, but it also includes other areas around oceans, so on and so forth. I think a second area is global engagement, uh, that we can bucket a number of areas where collaboration would be beneficial, uh, even including control in the future of pandemics and how to deal with pandemics. And thirdly, last but not least, the question of global regulation, needs for cyber regulation, financial regulation, issues around cross-border trade, so on and so forth. So despite those tensions and differences, it seems to me that some kind of collaboration is necessary if we want to move ahead with global public goods in their provision for the community of the world as a whole. So as Mark said, we'll have some robust discussion today, and we'll be starting with a panel uh, chaired by Yasheng Huang uh, from MIT, who does not have an honorary appointment at the Harvard Law School. And uh, I think it's going to be a very enjoyable uh, day of discussion. So thank you very much.